Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. Presenting Rivers of Living Water, a show about how to grow in holiness and having an intimate relationship with God. Jesus said in John chapter 7, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink uh, out of his heart, then will flow rivers of living water. And our hostess is back with us, Mary Schwartz. It's good to see you again, Mary, or hear from you. So Thank you. come on board. Okay. Now, one of the ways that Jesus fulfills his promise to give us rivers of living water is through the gift of contemplative prayer. And in contemplative prayer, we feel God's presence. The church says this prayer is not just for the great saints, but it's a gift that God wants to give all of us. So we will be talking about the virtues we need to grow in and how to pray so that we can obtain this gift of contemplative prayer, this living water in which we feel God's presence and which transforms us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Today, I want to talk about the three degrees of conversion, but then especially focus on the second degree of conversion, which is where most of us are, and talk about some common venial sins that we often overlook. In his very great retreat called Deep Conversion, Deep Prayer, Father Dubay says there are three degrees of conversion. And by the way, I strongly recommend that you buy this retreat. And you can get it in DVD form from the Sister Servants of the Eternal Word, or you can get it in book form. Again, it was called Deep Conversion, Deep Prayer. And Father Dubay said in the retreat that there are three degrees of conversion. And the first is when we give up mortal sin. He says this is when we make a 180 degree turn, when we turn back to God. And the most common mortal sins in the modern world are sexual sins. Sex outside of marriage, pornography and masturbation, fornication and adultery. But for something to be a mortal sin for you, it has to meet three conditions. It has to involve grave matter. You had to know that it was a grave sin. And finally, you had to have full consent of the will. So, for instance, if you have an addiction, you do not have full consent of the will. So when you commit one of these sins, these grave sins, objectively a mortal sin has been committed, but it may not be a mortal sin for you. So if you have an addiction to pornography, it is definitely not a mortal sin for you. If you have a habit, but it's not an addiction, it might not be a mortal sin for you. But you have an obligation to seek help and overcome the sin, either by going to daily mass and regular confession, and if that doesn't work, by seeking help from a Christian therapist or a 12-step program like Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. That program, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, can help you even if you don't have an addiction but only have a habit. Father Groeschel recommended that people go to, to go to it. Now, other mortal sins are abortion, murder, stealing a lot of money, lying about serious things or under oath. Slander can be a mortal sin. Blasphemy, which consists in uttering against God inwardly or outwardly words of hatred, reproach, or defiance is a mortal sin. Um, not going to Mass on Sundays is a mortal sin for Catholics, but remember, you had to know that it was a mortal sin 
Uh, other mortal sins would be if you're so angry at somebody that you deliberately wish them evil. That's a mortal sin. If, if you desire to wound somebody or kill someone, it's a mortal sin. Again, though, you have to have free consent of the will, and somebody may have hurt you so badly that your anger is not deliberate. Finally, envy. If you feel so envious at another's goods that you wish grave harm to your neighbor, that would be a mortal sin. Okay. So the first conversion, the determination to rid your life of mortal sin, is the most important one. Because mortal sin kills the life of grace in your soul. Grace is supernatural life in us. It's life that's above our natural level. It's more than human. It's, it's superhuman life, okay? Grace is actually God's life in us. And with it, we receive faith, hope, and charity and the other virtues, which transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Also, without grace in our soul, we cannot go to heaven, okay? We can't even go to purgatory. A Dominican priest named Father Walter Wagner says that when you are baptized, a new software is downloaded into your soul, okay? So when, you, when you're baptized, for the first time, you receive the grace, the gift of grace that stays in your soul. It's called sanctifying grace. And um, this new software includes the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. So this first degree of conversion is the most important um, because... Until, you know, because mortal sin kills the life of grace in your soul, although you get it back every time you go to confession, okay? So this first conversion is the most important, and it's also the most difficult. And it can sometimes people take people a very long time to give it up. But if they're sincere in wanting to give it up, they'll work at it, and eventually they will give it up entirely. Now, um, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I've already mentioned that. Um, that's the first degree of conversion. The second degree of conversion is becoming determined to get rid of venial sin in your life. Venial sins include uh, showing irritability or impatience, gossiping, eating too much, wasting time, that's, that might not be a sin, but maybe just a, a fault. Watching harmful TV, being late to Mass is a venial sin. And this distinction between mortal and venial sin, by the way, is scriptural, okay? In his first letter, the Apostle John makes a distinction between sin that is unto death and sin that is not unto death. That's in 1 John, chapter 5, line 16. Now, here's the really interesting thing. The great Saint, Saint Bernard, who lived in the Middle Ages, told his monks that there are more people converted from mortal sin to the state of grace than there are religious converted from good to better. Now, since St. Bernard was talking to his monks, he was talking about monks and nuns. But what he said is true of everybody. In other words, St. Bernard was saying there are more people who give up mortal sin, who go from bad to good, than there are people who give up venial sin and go from good to better. Despite the fact that the first conversion... Giving up mortal sin is much harder than the second conversion, giving up venial sin. And as you heard, St. Bernard said that more priests and religious do not give up venial sin than those who do. And that is a tragedy, okay? 
Now, it's true that venial sin does not kill the life of grace in our souls, but it wounds us. It it diminishes the amount of grace in our souls. And habitual venial sin, meaning sins that we commit often and don't try to uproot, can harden our hearts and prevent us from making progress in holiness. In fact, St. John of the Cross said that the reason more people don't grow in holiness is that they don't give up venial sin. And he said that venial sins hold us back from holiness like a piece of thread holding a bird. So I guess in his day, people tied their pet birds, you know, they tied the foot of the bird with a string to something so they couldn't fly away. And a string, of course, is much lighter than a chain, but it will still tie the bird down. Now, uh, I should say that Father Dubé was careful to point out that when he talked about venial sin, he meant things that we will. In other words, if we feel annoyed with someone, that feeling is not a sin because we're not willing it, okay? But if we snap at someone, then that is a venial sin because we can control what we do with our feelings of impatience. St. Francis de Sales said that we can never completely get rid of venial sin, at least not for a long period of time, but we can get rid of habitual venial sin, meaning venial sins that, that we commit frequently and that have become habits. And also... We can get rid of all attachment to venial sin, by which I mean all desire to continue in venial sin of some kind. I knew a priest who was an excellent priest, but he always gossiped. And I'm sure he knew that it was wrong, but he was not giving it up. And what a terrible tragedy that this very fine person was never really going to grow in holiness um, because of that. Okay, so I'm sure, you know, we all have something like that, most of us. If, If we don't, we're probably already in the third degree of conversion. So let's talk about that. The third degree of conversion is heroic virtue. And that is almost never talked about. And it means giving God everything. Or to put it another way, it means to live as the saints lived. So we are all called to heroic virtue. However, if you know that you're still committing a lot of venial sin, that's your next step. You don't have to, don't worry about heroic virtue until you've done that. Now, uh, Father Dubé, in the retreat, Deep Conversion, Deep Prayer, cites as an example of heroic virtue the early Christians to whom Paul wrote in his letter to the Hebrews. This is in chapter 10, beginning with line 34. These Christians were being persecuted for the faith, and St. Paul writes to them, You not only shared in the sufferings of those who were in prison, but you happily accepted being stripped of your belongings, knowing you were called to something that was better and lasting. So St. Paul was writing to everybody in that Christian community, not just to priests or to nuns, and he says that they had happily accepted being stripped of their possessions, knowing that their true home was in heaven. And Father Dubé says that these Christians were practicing heroic virtue. He says, imagine if a married couple who had gone on vacation came home to find that everything in their house was gone. Everything had been cleaned out by thieves. And imagine the two of them throwing their arms around each other and kissing each other and saying, isn't this wonderful? We've got nothing left. We can share in the cross of Christ who died with nothing. I'm so happy. Okay? And Father Dubé says, 
that that's what these early Christians did that Paul was writing to, okay? Um, Nobody can reach this degree of holiness by themselves. This is a gift that God gives to people because they wanted it and because they were willing to get rid of their venial sins. Father Dubay says that if we make a complete yes to God with our will, not yet with our feelings, but if with our will we accept whatever happens to us, God will make us grow in the spiritual life and give us the grace to actually feel this way. And that is the third stage of conversion. I'll just, uh, let me just say that a few, little more about it. Pope Benedict XIV, who was Pope from 1740 to 1758, wrote a, a three-volume work on heroic virtue, and he listed five characteristics of heroic virtue. He says, first, a, a person can do what is above the strength of normal people. For, let's say, laying down their life for the faith or giving away their money. Secondly, they can do this difficult thing that's above the strength of normal people promptly and easily. Remember that Our Lady went with haste to visit St. Elizabeth. Okay, they do what needs to be done, even though it's extremely difficult, promptly and easily. Third, they're very joyful in doing this difficult thing. So if, let's say, they're going to be martyred, they are joyful. St. Thomas More, when he was in the tower uh, preparing to be beheaded, waiting to be beheaded, said that he felt like a schoolboy on vacation. And fourth... The person of heroic virtue is always this way when doing very difficult things, not just once or twice. It's habitual. Uh, Garagou Lagrange gives... Garagou Lagrange was a great Dominican teacher on the spiritual life, and he wrote a great work called The Three Ways of the Interior Life, and in that book, he, gave, he gives several examples of heroic virtue in the lives of the saints in addition to martyrdom. Uh, for instance, one day um, a man saw St. Joseph Labore passing by and threw a stone at him, which struck him on the ankle, and um, blood gushed forth. The saint bent down, picked up the stone, kissed it, was undoubtedly praying for the man who had thrown it, and then placed the stone at the edge of the road so it wouldn't injure anybody else. Uh, Another example is a a holy French priest named Henri Marie Houdon, who was the counselor to his bishop. But somebody wrote a slanderous letter to the bishop, um, you know, saying untrue things about this priest, Marie Boudon. And so he was forbidden by the bishop to celebrate Mass and hear confessions. And when this priest received notice of this, he immediately threw himself at the foot of his crucifix and thanked God for this grace, which he said he was unworthy of. Okay? So they have a... a, a perfect promptness in accepting the cross. Garagou Lagrange also said that the distinctive marks of heroic virtue are dominated by charity towards those who make one suffer and by prayer for them. So that's, that's the distinctive sign of heroic charity, that you, of heroic virtue, that you love those who make you suffer and pray for them. Now, this third stage of conversion is for all of us, okay? People may say, that's not for me. Well, it is for you. And no matter how much we've sinned, too, in the past, or how, how low we've fallen, it, um, God wants all of us to uh, obtain this degree of conversion. In his, and in his 
book called The Ascent of Mount Carmel, in chapter 11, number 9, St. John of the Cross said that, quote, if a person remains faithful, the Lord will not cease raising him degree by degree until he reaches divine union and transformation. He adds, if individuals are victorious over the devil in the first degree, they will pass on to the second. And so, in the second, they will go to the third. And likewise, through all seven mansions, until the bridegroom puts them in the wine cellar of perfect charity. So there are seven degrees. I know I'm talking about only three degrees of conversion, but they're actually within those three degrees, seven stages of holiness. And St. John of the Cross is saying that if we remain faithful, God will um, bring us to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. Okay? And if we don't grow in holiness, it's because we are not faithful, not because God, it's not God's will for us to be there. Now, 99% of the people listening to this talk are no doubt working on the second stage of conversion, which is giving up our venial sins, and I am too. So I would like to discuss in the rest of this talk common venial sins and faults that we may overlook. Last week, we were talking about St. Francis de Sales' great masterpiece, Introduction to the Devout Life. And I'm going to go back to that today. Um, And first, I'm going to talk about meekness, which we also discussed last week. And you can look, you can listen to last week's talk. Um, it's posted on our website. So, St. Francis quoted St. Bernard, who said that meekness is the flower of charity, and that charity is perfect when it is not only patient but meek. Meekness is the virtue that regulates anger. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And elsewhere, he says, if someone strike you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And then Christ tells us to love our enemies and to pray for those who hurt us. Now, it's not a sin to feel anger. We often cannot help our feelings, but it's what we do with our feelings that matter. And it is the virtue of meekness that enables us to respond peacefully and gently when we are treated badly. St. Francis says that the devil often deceives people into thinking that they're humble and meek when they are not. And that becomes obvious when they respond with great arrogance to the least cross word or to the least little injury they receive. Okay, so if someone says a cross word to you and you get mad, you'll know you have to work on meekness. Uh, St. Francis's greatest weakness was anger. That was his predominant fault. But he became famous, and this is very beautiful, for his extreme gentleness with souls. And he says that when we know we have a fault or a vice, as he calls it, we have to practice the contrary virtue as much as we can. So if our predominant fault is anger, we have to practice meekness as much as possible. And he said, quote, I state absolutely and make no exception. Do not be angry at all if that is possible. Do not accept any pretext, whatever, for opening your heart's door to anger. And he quotes St. Augustine who said, It is better to deny entrance to just and reasonable anger than to admit it, no matter how small it is. Once let in, it is driven out again only with difficulty. It comes in as a little twig, and in less than no time, it grows big and becomes as a beam. So notice he says, St. Augustine said, do not 
It is better to deny entrance to just and reasonable anger. So your anger may be just and reasonable, but he's saying don't let it into your heart because you'll only get it out with great difficulty. Um, Okay. Also, we may be mistaken in thinking our anger is just. St. Francis says, you know, even if we usually feel much worse, that we were treated much more worse than, in fact, we were. Okay. Um, So as soon as we feel anger, we should muster our forces and make a serious effort to turn away from these feelings. But for St. Francis says that we mustn't do that violently because we'll do more harm than good. And then we should bring our feelings to God in prayer and ask him to free us from these feelings. Ask him to have mercy on us and ask him to help us the way he calmed the wind and the storm when the apostles were in the boat on the water. Okay? Um, St. Francis says, he will command your passions to cease and there will be a great calm. Uh, He says that we have to say these prayers against our anger peacefully and calmly or they'll stir us up again. And he says that as soon as we see that we've been guilty of an wrathful or angry deed, we have to make an act of meekness toward the person we were angry at. Another way to prevent ourselves from losing our temper is uh, when we are not angry and when we're calm, to do everything in the mildest way that we can. Um, In other words, to do and say things with great gentleness and sweetness. And there was a wonderful convert to the Catholic Church uh, from a Jewish background named Venerable Francis Lieberman, and he always used to say to his seminarians, Du sur, du sur, which is French for a combination of gentleness and sweetness. So a meek person can give advice or even reproach somebody in a way that is acceptable to them. And if we reproach someone with great kindness, it will often be well received, whereas if we do it with anger, it produces no results. Now, in addition to being meek with other people, St. Francis says we also have to be meek with ourselves when we commit faults. He says we shouldn't fret over our imperfections. He says, of course, we should be displeased and sorry when we commit a sin or a fault, but we should not get angry at ourselves or lose our peace. He says if we get angry, it's a sign of self-love. Okay, we're disturbed and upset at seeing that we are imperfect. And he says, um, well, actually, St. John of the Cross said that many people make grand resolutions about not sinning again, uh, but being self-confident and not humble, the more they make these resolutions, the more they fall and the more angry they become. And he says that they don't have the patience to wait for God's time, to wait for God to take away this sin Uh, And he says that that is opposed to spiritual meekness. Uh, So we should not beat ourselves up when we fail. In fact, we should expect to fail. Uh, Here's a quote from a very beautiful book that I strongly recommend to all of you. The book is called Searching for and Maintaining Peace. And it's by a French priest named Father Jacques Philippe. And he says this, Let us understand this. For the person of good will, now a person of good will is somebody who's trying to do the right thing and who actually wants to do God's will more than anything else. And he says, for that person, that which is serious in sin is not so much the fault itself as the despondency into which it places him. He who fails but immediately gets up has not lost much. He has rather gained in humility and the experience of mercy. He who remains sad and defeated loses much more. And he says that a sign of spiritual progress is not so much never 
falling into sin as it is being able to lift oneself up quickly after we fall. Okay? And the most important thing of all is not to stop praying after we sin. Jesus said, I did not come to call the just, but sinners. So if we, you know, if we accept to appear before God in our state of sin, then we will receive healing and we'll be transformed little by little into saints. So St. Francis says, if we've committed a small sin or a fault, uh, we should rebuke ourselves or any sin. We should rebuke ourselves in a calm, mild way with more compassion than passion and encourage ourselves to change. So instead of beating ourselves up and saying something like, you wretch, you know, you've made so many resolutions against vanity, and now you're being vain again. You should die for shame. You're a traitor against God. St. Francis says we should say something like, oh, dear, <laughs> we've fallen into that fault we wanted so much to avoid. Well, we have to get up again and leave it forever. We must call on God's mercy. Let us start again on the way of humility. God will help us. If, however, uh, we find that this gentle way of dealing with ourselves does not get any results, then we can rebuke ourselves more sharply, but only on the condition that afterwards we make an act of uh, confidence in God's tender love for us and in his help. St. Francis says, do not be surprised if you fall. He says, it is no wonder that infirmity should be infirm, weakness weak, Misery wretched, but with confidence in God's mercy, we have to return to the path of virtue. So I want to talk about some sins of the tongue that we often overlook. St. James said, quote, if a man does not offend in word, he is a perfect man. Uh, Now, St. Francis de Sales says that to scoff at others is one of the worst states we can be in. He says that God detests this vice. And he says, nothing is so opposed to charity than to despise and condemn one's neighbor. So as, as far as I can make out, scoffing is making fun of somebody with contempt. And he says it's always accompanied by derision and mockery and there and is therefore a very great sin. So I think that we have to be careful not to do this, you know, not only with people in our presence, you know, our colleagues or, or our family members or whatever, but we should be this way also when we're talking about political leaders we don't like, when we're talking about people whose political and religious views we don't share. Okay, scoffing is something we have to try to avoid um, because we're, we're, we're committing rash judgment, which is the next sin I want to discuss. Rash judgment can be a sin both of our thoughts or of our words. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, rash judgment is when we assume something something bad about our neighbor without sufficient evidence. So remember, Jesus said, judge not, lest you also be judged. Condemn not, lest you also be condemned. So being a saint, St. Francis takes an even broader view of the matter than the catechism and says that all judgments we make against somebody else are rash because we cannot read another person's heart. He writes, can we never pass judgment on our neighbor? And he answers, no. No, he says that knowing something about somebody or seeing something is not the same thing as judging. But he says, we have enough to do judging ourselves and that should keep us busy. St. Paul says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But St. Francis says, oh God, how differently do we act? By judging our neighbor on every occasion, we never stop doing what is forbidden, 
and we never do what is imposed on us, namely judge our, ourselves. Okay, so it's forbidden, forbidden to judge others, and moreover, we are told by God to judge ourselves. St. Francis says, some people have dispositions that are naturally bitter and harsh and always judge their neighbors with the greatest harshness. And St. Francis says that such people should put themselves under the care of a good spiritual physician. Since their bitterness is natural to them, it's very hard for them to overcome. And he says that their nature is not a sin, but an imperfection, but it's dangerous because it causes wrath, judgment, and detraction to predominate in their souls. St. Francis says that some men judge others because they have a lot of pride. And um, they feel that when they judge others, they're raising their own honor by lowering others. Uh, other men do not have so much obvious pride. It's not obvious, but they feel a secret, imperceptible satisfaction when they see the defects in other people. Uh, still other men accuse men of great vices rashly. In other words, they don't know for sure because it makes them feel less guilty about their own sins. Okay, we may not even realize that this is our motive. And uh, so remember that wrath judgment is accusing somebody in your heart or in your thoughts or in your words of sins where we, where, that we don't, in fact, know for sure that they have committed. Um, and in fact, St. Francis says anyway that we can never know what's in somebody's heart, so we should never judge anybody. He says that the antidote to rash judgment is charity. He says we must love others enough that we don't want to judge them and that we should ask God for this gift. Two other sins of the, t of the tongue are detraction and slander. The Catechism says that detraction is disclo disclosing another person's faults and failings to people who don't need to know about them. So let's say you're talking about somebody and you say that this person, you say that he's an alcoholic. Well, let's say that's true, okay? But the people you're talking to have no need to know that. That's called, that detraction. Where you're saying something's true, but, but something that's not flattering and that is unnecessary. So now sometimes we do have to, we have a moral obligation to warn somebody about somebody's faults. So if you know that a man is a thief and uh, you know someone who's thinking of hiring him to be an accountant, then you have a moral obligation to warn, you know, this, this person not to hire um, what you, this, you know, this man. Okay, but we should not be talking about other people's faults or failings unless we have a good reason to do so. Slander or calumny is when we damage or destroy another person's reputation by saying something that's not true. So you can see we have to be very careful of rash judgment and detraction because if we've judged rashly or falsely, we could be slandering somebody as well. Uh, in fact, St. Francis lumps them all together. So, first of all, he says, this is so beautiful how kind and gentle and charitable he is. He said, and this, remember, this is a saint, of course, and a bishop. He says that a single act does not justify the name of vice. He says that Noah got drunk once, but Noah was not a drunkard. And St. Peter shed blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he was not a bloodthirsty man. So he says, for something to deserve the name of vice, it has to be habitual. Secondly, he says that we have no certainty that a man who was a sinner yesterday is one today. He says, remember the tax collector who was judged by the Pharisee 
But at the very moment the Pharisee was judging him, the tax collector, tax collector had repented. He was saying, beating his breast and saying, Oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we should never draw conclusions from yesterday to today and still less to tomorrow. He says, it is true that we can speak openly of public notorious sinners, but we can only do it in a spirit of charity and compassion, not arrogantly or presumptuously. Another common sin of our time um, that very, very, very few people will admit to is avarice. That is to say, too great a desire for wealth. Uh, A priest in Manhattan told a friend of mine that he had never heard anybody confess avarice, okay, although it's so common. And an old spiritual director of mine told me that avarice gets worse, usually gets worse as you get older. Uh, And so St. Francis says a man is rich in spirit as opposed to being poor in spirit if his mind is set on riches. We can possess riches without being poisoned by them if we are not attached to them. And St. Francis says this is a very wonderful condition to be in because we have the advantage of having wealth, but we are still poor in spirit. But it's, this is very rare. Okay, um, If we are too... Uh, concerned about our goods, if we fear losing them with a strong, anxious fear, then we are too attached to them. If we are very upset when we lose some of our possessions, it shows that we love them too much. If we do not grieve over the loss of money or accept it meekly, St. Francis says we have some grounds for believing that we are not too attached to our money and are poor in spirit. He says, we can certainly take care of our goods and try to increase them, but if we're uneasy and troubled about them, then we are too attached. St. Francis recommended that people who are rich give frequently to the poor, give, give generously to the poor. And he also recommended helping the poor personally, serving them with our own hands just as Mother Teresa would. St. Francis says that if we're really poor, not just in spirit, but in reality, he says we should make a virtue of necessity and accept it because it is God's will for us. He says also the other great advantage to us of being poor, if we're lay people, is that our state is despised, okay, because it's not by choice. He says when monks and nuns are poor, they are esteemed, okay, but when a lay person is poor, he's despised. And St. Francis says that that's a great advantage to us and that we should not complain about our poverty. On the subject of dress... St. Francis said that we should dress modestly and simply. He said our clothes should be clean and neat. There should be nothing negligent or careless about the way we dress. And he says that it shows a kind of contempt for those we are with if we dress negligently or carelessly um, in unbecoming attire. So he says... However, that at the same time, we have to avoid vanity and affectation. He writes that, quote, and this is very interesting, I would have devout people, whether men or women, always the best dressed in the group, but the least pompous and affected. So that's interesting, because sometimes devout people, especially women, will feel that they shouldn't pay attention to their dress, or it gives them permission to not bother with it. But we should always try to look nice, but obviously within our means, um, and not worry if we can't can't afford to. Um, But these words of St. Francis remind me of the words of St. Louis, the King of France, 
who said that a man should dress to please his wife. And if that's true, needless to say, a woman should dress to please her husband. St. Francis said, each one should dress according to his, rather St. Louis, the king of France, also said, each one should dress according to his condition so that the wise and the good may have no reason to complain that you do too much or the young people to say that you do too little. I knew uh, a woman whose mother became a third order Franciscan and so, although she had quite a bit of money, she always dressed very badly, and her daughter was ashamed of her. Anyway, that's definitely not something especially a married woman should do, okay? So, as I said before, venial sins um, do, do not destroy the life of grace in our soul, and they don't break our friendship with God, but they do diminish the amount of grace in our soul. And so we should confess at least some of our venial sins when we go to confession. I, I don't, you don't need to confess all of them unless, you know, there's nobody online. Um, but confess maybe the ones that are most frequent or the most serious. Um, and we need to do that because it, it, if we don't confess our venial sins, then we, we stop taking them seriously and we stop trying to overcome them. Also, when you go to confession, you're given a special grace to help you overcome the sin that you've confessed. And um, I, I will mention, though, that when you go to Holy Communion, all your venial sins are washed away. You know, if you go to Holy Communion worthily, if you're in a state of grace. And likewise, at the Mass, when we say the, the Confidior, which begins, I confess um, to God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. When we say that prayer, um, all of our venial sins are forgiven. Um, so that's something nice to know. So we have to really be determined to overcome venial sin in our lives. And a good way to do that is to make an examination, of, a daily examination of conscience. I was taught a wonderful way to do this by a Jesuit priest named Father Katursky, but it's it's basically the, the way that St. Ignatius taught people to make a daily examination of conscience. And it um, is based on the acronym GRACE. An acronym is a word of all capital letters, and each of the letter, capital letters stands for something. So the acronym GRACE stands for gratitude, request for light, that's R, um, accounting for actions and attitudes, uh, charting a new course, and enthusiasm. So let's go through those one at a time. Um, when you make your daily examination of conscience, you, you want to look at the things, you know, your, your, the, the sins you committed that day, but you can also look at what went well that day, too. But the first thing you want to do is, is G, G for grace, right? G is gratitude. Tell God the things you are grateful for. Um, that's a very, very helpful spiritual practice. They have a slogan at, Al, at uh, AA and other 12-step programs, keep gratitude in your attitude. <laughs> so you make a little gratitude list of the things you're grateful for. That's G. And the next letter in grace is R, and that's request for light. So you ask God to give you light. You ask him or you ask the Holy Spirit to show you the things he wants you to see the most about yourself. Then the, and also here is a good time to ask for the gift of humility. 
because humility is seeing the truth about yourself. Then the next letter in the word grace is A, which, and so here we want to make um, an accounting of our actions and attitudes. So you're going to think about what were my attitudes and actions since the last time I did this um, that I need to ask God's pardon for or need to correct. And then um, C, and then you make an act of contrition. And then C stands for charting a new course. So you take one of your sins one of, and you say to yourself, how can I overcome this sin? So let's say the sin is talking too much. You make a resolution, let's say, that the next, you know, whenever I'm in danger of talking too much, I'm going to pray to Our Lady to help me stop. Um, Or let's say it's the sin of detraction, that you're gossiping too much. You're not saying things that are false. You're saying things that are true, but they are not flattering. They're not things that other people need to know. So let's say you decide that I'm going to, every morning I'm going to say a memorare to the Blessed Virgin to help me not to uh, commit the sin of detraction. And then maybe before you make a resolution that before you get together um, with, let's say there are certain friends who really like to gossip that you have. And you know, and they want you to gossip too, so they don't feel bad. And you know, you're going to be on a lot of, in, un, under a lot of pressure to gossip. Before you get together with them, you have to kind of screw your head on straight, pray to Our Lady, you know, ask her to give you the grace not to be a people pleaser and not to gossip, no matter what. In fact, maybe you'll even have to say to your friend. Um, in the middle of it, you know, I really don't want to gossip. And um, that can be hard to do. Okay, but anyway, so this fourth step is is charting a new course, making a resolution about how you're going to avoid one of your common habitual sins. And then the final step is E, the last letter of the word grace. And E stands for... Um, asking the Holy Spirit for enthusiasm in carrying out your resolution. So, you know, you've made this resolution not to commit the sin of detraction. You ask the Holy Spirit to give you enthusiasm to carry out this resolution. And that is how you make a really good examine, a daily examination of conscience If you um, want to know about more about possible venial sins that you could be committing, I would recommend reading the section on the Ten Commandments in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's online. If you don't own a copy, you can read it for free. Or you could go, you know, go to a Catholic bookstore and, and look at some of the catechisms and um, read about venial sins. So I think that brings us to the end of today's show. And um, I think that we will close with a prayer, okay? So you've been listening to Rivers of Living Water with Mary Schwartz a show about how to grow in holiness and have an intimate relationship with God. We air on Thursdays at 4, but you can listen to past shows on our website. The website, as you know, is at En Route Books and Media uh, for WCAT. And we hope you've enjoyed your time with us today. So let's close with a prayer. Blessed Trinity, We pray for the grace to be determined to give up venial sin in our lives. And we also ask you for the grace to know what venial sins we need to give up and to 
uh, be persistent in working to uproot them from our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mary, in the name very of the good Father, presence. Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Mary, a very good presentation. I did have a couple of comments that uh, we do have a few minutes before we close. But uh, one is I like you brought up that, that uh, the word scoffing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that right now in, uh, in our national scene. You know, scoffing the president, uh, yes. Trump, uh, other people scoffing uh, Obama. And yes. I read a very, a very good article on, uh, on the Internet by an evangelical woman mm-hmm. who, uh, of course, said, you know, there are a lot of things we don't agree with on Obama, President Obama. But he did improve race relations. He was a really strong family man. He was always shown with his family. Mm-hmm. She just numbered three or four things that were good things about yeah. Obama. And that's yeah. the, what we have to concentrate on. Right. You know, I, yes. In other words, we're not going we to agree with everything. We can't, right. We can't scoff at our political enemies. Including, okay, you know, a, not just the leaders, but even, you know, people who don't agree with us politically and religiously. Right? We have, another, have to have charity. Yeah. And another thing that we can do is, uh, like, I had a friend who was a football coach, and this bus driver was always putting him down, saying, ah, he did this and did that and did those things. And I said, well, you know, that's not the, that's, that's not the guy I know. I said, the man I know that you're talking about is a man that puts his children to, to bed at night, prays with them, reads to them. Uh, he does many things like that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, you know, I don't know all these things you're telling me about him, these, these other things, but I said, there's, I know there's a lot of good about him. So mm-hmm. we can come back with something uh, when a person says something against another person, that we can come back and defend them. Right. And that's, that's the way true. to counter, and it is the way to counter some of these things. And uh, generally, that was a beautiful presentation. <laughs> Thank you and very much. Can, you could really cover the ground. And it's something that, you know, a lot of people aren't, aren't really... Uh, uh, that well up on, and like the, I like that suggestion where you said they they should read the section of the Catechism uh, about the Ten Commandments. Yeah, that's where the the information is about what is a sin and what isn't a sin, and um, beautiful. And your quotes were outstanding, so really, really, really powerful. Thank well, you thank very you, Mary, much. And, We'll see you again next week, same time, same station, on uh, WCAT Radio. You've already done the prayer, but I wish uh, that the Lord would bless each and every one of you. So we meet again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.